quick check. Can you guys see the, the slide okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. So my main goal, so colorectal surgery is, uh, like, like Sue said, I'm a practicing colorectal surgeon and general surgeon uh, down here in Miami, Florida. Um, I've been attending for about a year, almost a year and a half. Um, so my main goal is to help you guys get a nice high yield review of colorectal surgery on the app site, which is actually a pretty good chunk of the app site. Um, but the material is pretty straightforward. There are a couple places that they'll try to trick you and that's my job to help you out. So I'm hoping to get about 30, 40 minutes of, uh, of material review. And I do have some nice um, app side CSAP questions um, for the remaining time. All right. So biggest thing I talk about for app side for you guys is prep. You got, this is all, this is a big test. This is something you don't cram for. You have to prepare for, think about it. So get a good night's sleep, get, make yourself an awesome breakfast um bring snacks okay you need your brain energy like constantly um one of your talkers for this thing was uh is dan walker who is one of my chief residents also a yukon alumni obviously he make fun of me for all the snacks i would bring i would show up with a bag of nutrigrain bars peanut butter banana sandwiches uh, a big thing of coffee like three water bottles um you need it you need it it's a long test it is not a one hour test it's multi hours you're allowed to take breaks take them get a snack, you know, you know, get, get that brain energy going. All right. Most important thing, take the fear out of the test. It's just a test. You can beat the test. You prepare for it. Then you're going to do well. If you cram for it and are shaky, not confident, you know, you're just going to go downhill from there. Okay. This test is all about knowing the principles and practice of the certain, um, uh, uh, you know, a part of parts of surgery. They're not going to try to trick you with things that are nuanced, things that are debated, things like that. They're not going to do that because the answers are not hundred percent concrete. All right. So just remember that it's the concepts and the main principles and the safe practices. All right. So this is what you all think about the test. Okay. And I'm here to change that conception to make it beatable. Okay. All right. So basics of colorectal surgery and uh, is, is anatomy. It all goes back to anatomy. Anytime I'm doing a resection, I have to think about the anatomy. It just makes it easier for me to process. So if you remember the anatomy of the colon, arterial blood supply, that already is like two, three questions. All right. So, you know, for your right colectomy, you're going to take your ileocolic and you're going to take your right colic and the mid, the mid, the right portion of the mid colic. And that's actually the, the, the bigger artery because most people actually don't have a right colic. You know, for your sigmoid, you're going to take your IMA, okay? You know, for your left colons, you're going to take your left colic. Uh, you know, for your transverse, you're going to take your mid colic, okay? Knowing those vessels for your resection, automatic one, one to two points, okay? Here's a little nice basic of the venous drainage, the ileocolic veins, the right colic veins, and the sigmoid veins as well, okay? For the rectum, um, they don't get too high yield into the rectum, but just the main points. Um, your superior rectal artery, which takes off, is actually your first branch of your IMA, also called the superior hemorrhoidal artery, does supply the, the rectal sigmoid junction and the upper rectum. You'll get your mid-rectum from your internal iliac arteries and the pudendal arteries, um, and those are pretty much the main points of that one. Um, venous drainage, mainly all come from the, of the internal pudendal veins, especially the mid and lower rectum, and, uh, and down towards the sphincters as well, you get your inferior rectal vein as well. I've rarely ever seen a, an anatomy question based on this type of anatomy. Okay, so function of the colon, this they ask a lot. So what is the function of your colon? Your colon is made to secrete potassium and reabsorb sodium and water, okay? All the, all the areas are retroperitoneal, except the transverse colon, which is very you know floppy and, and right over there and not really tied down to anything except your greater omentum. Um, in terms of, I have seen it before, that the portion of the colon that absorbs the most water is your ascending colon. Okay. Um, the nerve complexes, it's, it's been brought up before. Meisner's is the inner, our back is the outer. Um, I don't, I, I love mnemonics, but I, I've never come up with a good one for this. Um, I just remember ma as, as thing. So ma going from inside to the out. Um, the colonocytes site's main food source is short chain fatty acids. That's always a guaranteed question, as well as um, enterocytes. If you remember enterocytes, their main food source is glutamine. They love that question. Um, so polyps, they love asking about polyps. Hyperplastic polyps are the most common, no risk of cancer. Tubular adenomas is your most common pro-neoplastic polyp. 75% is usually pedunculated, meaning they come in a stock like a mushroom. Um, villus adenoma are general sessile and larger than tubular adenomas. 
Um, and depending on the size, fit as high as 50% of them can hide a cancer. Uh, hence the word villus, okay? Especially if they're over two centimeters. Uh, most pulps you can take out endoscopically. Those that, that you can't likely need a resection. There are a couple of institutes that do a very advanced endoscopic resections and things like that, but they're not going to test you about that. Okay, so y'all have a picture of normal colon. This is more of a sessile polyp right here. You see it's kind of flat and stuck to the mucosa. This is a nice little pedunculated polyp uh, where it has a little mushroom top and a stalk. And ideally when you're resecting them, you want to go down as much as the stalk as possible because sometimes the tumor can hide in the stalk. Okay, so um, and, you know now you have the high-grade polyps. Okay, so invasive cancer, this is, they love to trick you on this. Invasive cancer means it is invading the submucosa. Okay, if you have a, if you have a, so again, and why is that? What is so important about the submucosa? Okay, I, I forgot to say before. I like to be interactive, so you guys can chime in anytime. the The mode I presented in does not really let me see the comments. Um, but if you want to say something or have a question, just go ahead and just jump in. And if I'm asking a question, jump in and give the answer. So why is the submucosa so important in colon, colon and rectal cancer? Strength layer. Not the strength layer so much. Lymphatic. Submucosa is when you start getting the lymphatics. Thank you for somebody who's saying it. The lymphatic vessels start coming into the submucosa. So this is when you start to get invasion and possibly towards the lymph nodes. Okay. Intramucosal cancer has not gone through the basement membrane of the mucosa. So it is not invasive. So if you get a big polyp and you're able to get a full clean margin and it says intramucosal cancer, not touching the basement membrane, you're done. There's no chance of invasion and never touch the submucosa. Okay. High grade dysplasia means the basement membrane is intact, but the cells appear abnormal. Okay. That's something to keep an eye on because high grade dysplasia can be a risk for cancer. All right. Especially for a especially for a big tumor that you only take a biopsy out of. Remember, sometimes the tumor is not the first thing you see. It's underneath all that all that mucosa, and that's a very big topic that you know patients like to ask too. Like, oh, okay, I got this big tumor, but the biopsy says is this. Remember, you're only taking a piece. You only like scraping the top of the iceberg. Okay. Um, hence, the importance of resection and margins during endoscopy are very important. If you have a question about about your your specimen, you call your pathologist. Okay, so lights, camera, action. So colonoscopy um, every ten years. Um, okay, they will they will ask about high sensitivity fecal occult or cologuard. Sometimes I've only I've seen it a couple of times. It's getting a little bit more common now that it's out and about and been on the market for a long time. It's every three years, along with a flex thing every five years, is the other acceptable um, passage. As a colorectal surgeon, I think cologuard is no good. I've seen many, many patients that have come to me for negative cologuards with colon cancers. So take it. You know, there's a lot of things with cologuard that we do not understand yet. Um, but if they're going to ask you a question about that, then this is an acceptable answer. If not, it's colonoscopy every 10 years. Okay, when do we start scoping? As of February 2021, which I think is long enough now for this app site, it's going to be start at 45 years old. Okay. Um, what they love to ask about is family history and how that, that affects your, your timing of scopes. So if you have a positive family history, meaning any primary relative member under the age of 65 that was diagnosed of colon cancer, your, your age starts at 40 or 10 years before the diagnosis of the youngest member. So for example, if your mom had colon cancer at age 45, you're getting your first scope at 35, not 40. But if you'll say your dad had colon cancer at 52, your first scope is at 40, not 42. They love, love to ask that. And they love to, to trick that up all the time. Remember, primary relative is children, uh, siblings, and, um, and, uh, and parents, okay? Grandparents, auntie, cousin do not count technically as primary relatives, okay? So why do we scope? Okay, so colon can colorectal cancer is the fourth most common cancer in the in the United States, but it's the second leading cause of cancer death behind lung cancer. Okay, what does that mean? It means if you catch this early, it's treatable. If you catch it, if you catch it late, the 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 five year pro uh, survival rates are are not very good. Okay, so it's very key, and that's why we scope so much because it is for the most part a preventative cancer.
Okay. Most common symptoms that, that people will talk about anemia, constipation, change in bowel patterns, very big one, especially change in cali in the caliber of the stool. You always want to ask that to your patients and bleeding. Okay. Uh, the main gene types that they like to ask, APC, DCC, P P53, and KRAS. APC, I will talk about that one a lot. It's the most common one. Sigmoid colon is the most common site for primary sites of cancer. The right colon is the most common missed spots because not everybody gets to the right colon and the cecum. But the sigmoid colon is still the most common site for, for colon cancers. Okay. They will try to trick you with that. Okay, so I like to break up the, the, the presentation with a little bit of case, which allows us to get into more topics. Okay, so 55 year old females in the hospital after a fall showing a hemoglobin of 7.4. You notice that for the last four years, her hemoglobin has been slowly going down. Patient tells you that she's noticed some blood mixed in her stool. What do you want to do next? Shout it out. HMP. I'm giving you the HMP. <laughs> She needs a scope. She needs a scope, right? Even if, even if even if I give you no other history, 55 years old, man, have you ever had a colonoscopy? No. Get in the scope, okay? All right, full h &P. Make sure you ask about scope history, family history, IBD, and polyps, okay? Uh, colonoscopy, you see this. What does that look like? Someone describe it to me, other than ugly. <clears throat> a partially obstructing mass. Right. It looks ugly. It looks like a mask. looks like you could maybe get the scope through, but definitely it's partially obstructing. Yep. All right. All right. What if the patient presents to you with a flex sig from a GI showing that picture? Just a flex sig. What else you got to do? Full scope to oh, check oh, for synchronous yeah. lesions. Bingo. What is the risk of a synchronous cancer? Twenty percent. Mm -hmm. Depending on who you read, anywhere from five to nine percent. What's the chance of a synchronous polyp? Thirty percent. So you need to check out the rest of the colon. The worst thing you can do is take out the person's sigmoid and they have a big tumor growing on the right colon. All right, all right. So what's next after you after you see that that scope, you see that imaging, you got the full scope. What else does this patient need? Send it for path and then also get CT chest and pelvis staging. Okay. Right, staging, right. So someone said a chest, CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis. Okay, anything else you want to do? Any type of blood work you want to do? CEA. Very good, CEA, okay? All right. Good, we talked about all that, all right? So CEA is not always elevated in all cancers, okay? It's a good marker for pre-treatment and post-treatment to continue to monitor for recurrence. There is a lot of new products out there that will actually, it's called, you know, it's tumor DNA. And there's a bunch of companies that do them. I myself use, use Natura. And what they do is they take a biopsy of the specimen and they actually take some blood samples of the patient and they create a CT DNA marker. And they use that to monitor recurrence. So I really like it because it's like the, per, the patient's own personalized DNA marker. So I send all my patients for that. Cause CEA, like I said, is not always elevated in, in all the colorectal cancers. Um, Another one they love to ask, and sometimes it's good for your knowledge as well, you're taking somebody to surgery, let's say for an obstructing tumor, and you forget to get CEA. And, you know, again, it's not the biggest end of the world because CEA has a very long half-life. CEA has a half-life of three to six months, which is when you notice that when the oncologists get their next CEA, it's always three to six months. If CEA had such a short half-life, why don't we get it right after surgery? There's no point because your preoperative CEA and your postoperative CEA are going to be the exact same. Because CA's half-life is really long. So CT, CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, we said that very important. Why is that? Why do we get that? C, why do we get those CT scans? Check for Mets. Liver, Mets. Liver Mets is number one most common metastatic disease of colon and rectal cancer. And the lungs are number two. So that's why we check both. Okay. All right, now let's say this was in the rectum. Let's say this is in the middle of the rectum. Is there any other additioning you, uh, any additional imaging you'd want to get? MRI. MRI what? The rectum, pelvis, with rectal rectum protocol. And the, rectum and the prolapse, rectal protocol. Very good, okay? All right, so the reason why behind that is why. Why do we want to do that? Circumferential reception margin. That one, 
And also you're checking for lymph nodes, right? Because in rectal cancer, we are we don't we don't we don't usually cut first for rectal cancer. If it's a high enough stage of a cancer via the MRI and via the pathology, rectal cancer gets preoperative chemo radiation first versus colon cancer, which is mainly takeout first. Okay. So we get to the time to cut, right? So how much colon do I take? What vessels? Ostomy versus no ostomy. These are things that you have to think in your head when you're approaching the surgery, okay? So obviously how much colon you take and what the vessels are, it's based on the location of the tumor. Sigmoid, left colon, right colon, that's gonna determine what type of surgery you're gonna do, okay? And you know, this obviously may, makes sense. Why do these big resections, even though it's a, maybe a small cancer, it's based on the blood supply. You're taking these big vessels to get a good lymph node harvest because the lymph nodes are in the mesentery and it's what you got to give to the pathologist to determine if they have lymph nodes involved. Okay. All right. So that is a main part of your goal resection End block resection, adequate margins, mesocolon, uh, uh, the mesocolon and a regional lymphadenectomy, which if you do a good resection is going to be in your mesocolon. Okay. Anybody remember what your adequate margins are for colon cancer, proximal and distal? Five, five centimeters, centimeters in two. Correct, five mm -hmm. centimeters. And then when you're talking about rectal cancer, you're gonna talk about fascias that the rectum has. They're gonna be Waldeers and Denevers, okay? I've never seen an app site mention any of these two fascias. It might be the first time e uh, some of you guys ever hear these fascias, um, but they are the fascias in your mesorectum. The Waldeers is, is in the posterior, the Denevers is in the anterior. Um, the way I remember is not a very, Pleasant mnemonic, but D W D is close to something males have towards the front. That's how you remember it. Very easy. Okay. So what the cut? This is a, I really like this diagram. It shows pretty much kind of an end block resection of what you're gonna do: low anterior resection, higher anterior resections, sigmoid colons, left hemocolectomies, right, and so on. So it's a nice little uh, nice little table to remember what you're gonna take out for what surgery. Okay. Um, say, and then I'll talk about ostomy. So for ostomies, especially for low anteriors and, you know, you know, mild and anterior, high anterior resections, what they're going to ask you on the app side is you're going to go through a, you know, upper rectal, mid rectal cancer. You're going to do your anastomosis. Everything looks great. Leak test is negative. Everything looks great. But your anastomosis is four centimeters away from the anal verge. The principles of giving somebody a diverting loop ileostomy, one, if you're concerned of blood supply, Two, if the anastomosis is five centimeters or lower um, to the anal verge, you should give them a diverting loop ileostomy. Yes, there are some particular cases, some patients and some surgeons that will push the envelope a little bit. But remember, this is about teaching you the principles and safe practice. Okay. So less than five centimeters concerning blood supply. You know, obviously, if you're even concerned about blood supply, you shouldn't be doing it anyways. But also patient factors. Are they a bad diabetic? Do, are they a chronic steroid user? Those are the factors that you got to think, man, should I divert this patient? So final staging, okay? So TNM is every single cancer you will ever have, TNM. But they are different for each type of cancer, okay? Sometimes the T stage is based on something else. T is always something about the tumor characteristic. That's how I remember it. And in terms of colon and rectal cancer, it's all about the depth of penetration to the colon and rectal wall. It has nothing to do with the size. I've taken out five, six centimeter tumors that just invaded the submucosa, which is a T1 and nothing else. All right. And I've invaded, and I've taken out smaller tumors that are one, two centimeters that went right through to the serosa. So the size doesn't matter. It's the depth. Okay. So you have a nice little table that lists out there. The N stage is the lymph nodes. One to three is N1 over four is N2 and N3 is central nodes are positive, meaning periaortic or periaortic as well. This is a quick table uh, for the American uh, Joint Commission of Cancer. Um, this colon cancer is very, very easy when it comes to staging. You just have to remember any lymph node at all that's involved is automatic stage three. You can have a T1 tiny little tumor, but there's one of 15 nodes positive stage three. I have never seen on the app site, they get into the very specifics of 2AB, you know, 3C, 3B, things like that, that they do for other cancers. I've never seen that on the app site. Colorectal boards, yes. But on the app site, I've never seen that. Usually they, they're going to ask you stage two or stage three or stage four. So just remember any lymph nodes positive at all, even one, 
automatic stage three. For stage four, uh, excuse me, for stage four, any metastasis at all, stage four, okay? So that, it, it, to, to me, the, this, this is one of the easier stagings to remember, okay? So how about lower, okay? Location, location, location. We talked about this. It's in terms of your need for diverting loop ileostomy, and as well as it changes your surgery. If the tumor is low enough, we're not talking about LAR anymore, right? Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about APR. APR. APR, permanent ostomy, big life-changing um, event for the patient, okay? All right, so you need to, if, when you get a console for a rectal, for a rectal cancer, you got to know where it is, okay? Really, really important. And so how would you do that? Let's say you get a, a phone call about a rectal mass on the CT scan, okay? What do you need to do to figure out the length, the type, biopsy? You do your flex sig, you do your colonoscopy, okay? Me personally, and some colorectal surgeons will agree, if I, when I get consults or referrals for rectal tumors and they come from the GI doctors, before I take them to surgery, I scope them myself because I, you know, we've all been in that situation where the your GI colleague will say, oh yeah, it's eight centimeters from the anal verge. And lo and behold, you get in there and like, you can feel it with your finger. Like, like that changes your surgery completely. All right. So I, I tend to scope them myself. Uh, it's just my practice. You know, sometimes the patients will get annoyed about it, but been burned once, never want to get burned again. All right. Um, if low enough and it's a T1 lesion, this they can ask you about. It is becoming a little bit of a hot topic, especially when it comes to T2 lesions. But T1 lesions can be removed transanally with tamises, um, even robotic tamises, which are actually really fun procedures. OK, but the key rules is less than four centimeters, at least a two millimeter margin. It's got to be well differentiated and there's got to be no invasion, no lymphovascular invasion at all. No suspicious lymph nodes. The other thing is the less than four centimeters, they can also show that as it's less than 30% circumferential, okay? Meaning you can't take out a 90% circumferential obstructing tumor. Some places will push the envelope, but these are generally the, the, the safe practices, okay? T2 is possible, okay? But it's it, it's a very debatable topic. I, I highly doubt on the app they're going to ask you guys about T2s, Okay. Uh, if a tumor involves the sphincters, you need an APR. That 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 is classic question. If it's touching the internal external sphincter, it's invading into it. The margins are not are not going to be clean based on the MRI. APR. Okay. So adjuvants to surgery. Right? So for colon cancer, um, stage three and stage four, postoperative chemo. Very 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 rare that we give radiation for colon cancers. The only time you really give radiation for colon cancers is if you have a very big, nasty tumor that is obviously invading into the abdominal wall. In that case, you try to get as much of an end block as possible. And then what I would do is I would leave some clips behind so that the radiation oncologist has a target to go after. All right. But again, that's exceedingly rare. For the most part, stage three and stage fours are going to get chemotherapy. All right. Is there anything in colon cancer that would make you guys give preoperative chemotherapy. Hepatic METs. Correct, right, hepatic METs or, or pulmonary METs, right? They have metastatic disease. They have stage four disease proven on imaging. In that case, we have shown that operating on those people and removing the primary tumor when they're already stage four gives no survival benefit at all. In fact, the morbidity goes up because you're doing a big surgery on them. And for most of the part, if it's a nasty obstructing tumor, sometimes you're going to end up uh, with an ostomy. But what are some cases where you do have a stage four tumor and you have to operate on them? What are, what are some cases? Very restricted. Huh? Obstruction. Obstruction and, and another one. Perforation. Well, yeah, perforation is a big one, but what, one more, one more. Bleeding. Bleeding is another one. They can't stop bleeding. The tumor bleeds. The tumor bleeds every day. The patient is, is consistently dropping his uh, their hemoglobin to 7.1, 6.5. Um, my last, actually, my uh, the, uh, uh, last Monday, I had to take out a right colon cancer. The guy was stage four, but I mean, the goal was to treat him with chemotherapy. I, I even put the port in him, but the guy literally would be in the hospital 
you know, once a week with GI bleed and drop his hemoglobin. And eventually we, I just got with the oncologist and said, listen, I'm going to take this out because this guy will never get the chemo or what's going to happen. He's going to start his first stage of chemo bleed and get interrupted all over again. So I ended up taking, taking the, the right colon out. Um, and it wasn't obstructing, it was just bleeding, but the guy, the guy did okay, but now he can start his chemotherapy and hopefully get on the path to recovery. So when it comes to rectal cancer now, high grade stage two and stage three rectal cancers, they get pre-op chemo. Okay. Usually it's full Fox. There's a bunch of other combinations. Very rare. They'll ask on the app site what the chemo regimens are, but just know for rectal cancer, they're going to get preoperative chemo and radiation. Okay. What, what makes, what makes something a high grade, a high grade stage two? Lymphovascular invasion. Correct. So what, what T stage would that be? T3. T3. Correct. T3. And then obviously stage three, if there's a lymph node that's suspicious or that the, 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 the radiologist saying this is positive, automatic stage three, preoperative chemo radiation. And Question? then you get this. Oh, sure. Someone touched upon it earlier uh, about the rectal cancer saying MRI. Um, what's your what's your personal thoughts versus absite thoughts on MRI versus EUS? I've heard both. I, I, I personally, if you're going to go for the highest standard of care now, it's MRI because the uh, endo, the don't get me wrong, endo, endorectal ultrasounds are pretty interesting and they're fun to do. The problem is they're very, very user dependent. And also the reading is user dependent. The radiologist is not reading this with you. It's you as the colorectal surgeon or one of your GI colleagues that is reading this. I tend to use an endo, uh, I tend to use the ultrasounds more for diagnosing sphincter injuries, like after, after an OB um, injury, like a bad episiotomy. I don't really use it for, for rectal tumors. I use the MRIs. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I doubt the app side is going to be that nitpicky about it, but if they're going to give you a choice between the two, I would say mo I would say pretty much all, um, you know, national uh, uh, organizations are going to say MRI is going to be better bang for your buck. Okay. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I've had a question before that says like after colonoscopy, if it's a rectal tumor, um, that you should also get a rigid proctoscope to get actual length. Um, is that something that you think that they're going to still require? Yeah, you, you, you could do that. I mean, but honestly with, uh, with, if you do, if you know how to handle the scope very well, you can, you can tell how does it, because you can, you can actually make the, the colonoscopy. I don't know if you guys, for you guys that have had your colonoscopy rotations already, you can make the colonoscopy rigid. You can turn the flexibility all the way, all the way down, and it gets pretty stiff. And and with that, you can you can have a good idea of how long it is. Can you do a rigid proctoscope? You can. I I I I not the biggest fan of rigid proctoscopes just because if something is bleeding or they're not very well prepped, you can't see anything. You can't see much. So that that's why I I personally like the 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 scope. Can't, the rigid procto does come up on the app site. They may ask you that because the rigid scope doesn't bend or doesn't flex like the scope. Um, but I have never seen a question about that. Like they'll tell, they'll ask you to, to go between the two. But the key thing is that fact that you're measuring it. That's that's what they really want you to know. They want you to know. Oh, you have a rectal cancer. You better measure it. You got to find out how how high up it is. Okay. Um, so in terms of radiation, chemotherapy, what does radiation do? Is, isn't chemo just good enough? It, it, was, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Say it again. It makes the chemo more effective. Correct. It's a chemo sensitizer. Um, very good. Okay. Also lowers local recurrence and it increases survival when combined with chemotherapy. Okay. Um, radiation has side effects. Um, and they, they can't ask you about this. I've had it before. Side effects include vasculitis, strictures, ulcers, bleeding sphincter damage as well the the in terms of the sphincter damage it is getting better just because now you know with radio with the advances in radiation especially radiation oncology they're getting more precise of where the radiation hits so it's not so much of a widespread blast anymore it's very concentrated okay so and then another thing it can help you shrink the tumor to hopefully downgrade yourself to an, a feasible lar with a possible low coloanal anastomosis versus an APR. Because you gotta remember, APR is permanent ostomy. You can never reverse it. LAR, if obviously it's gonna be low in this guy's case, um, you know, that's a diverting loop ileostomy for six to eight weeks. 
um, and then you reverse it. Okay. So it, it's a, you know, for a lot of patients, it's a big difference. Okay. So let's say we did this ladies, it's called a sigmoid tumor. You took it out. You did a great job. Um, and oh, another, another good question that they love to ask uh, before I get to this part is let's say you take out this sigmoid tumor and you give the, let's call it a T3 uh, N0 M0 tumor, but you only gave the pathologist to say 10 lymph nodes. Is that enough? No. no, what do you need? What's the minimum? 12, 12, 12, 12. 12. For colon and rectal cancer, it's 12. So now what happens with this patient? What do you have to do? You have to treat him as a what? H3. You got to upstage them. Yeah, you got to upstage them because you're concerned about the lymph node harvest. So you need to upstage them, which is a big deal because stage two, no chemo. Stage three, chemo. All right, so let's say you take out this lady sigmoid tumor and she asks you, oh, thank you, doctor, I feel great. What, uh, when do I see you again? All right, so it's on the screen. So you need to rescope these patients one year after resection and then three, then five. Now, remember, it's one year after resection, three years after resection, five years after resection, not one year, then three years later, then five years later. People get confused about that. Okay. What is the point of scoping them? What are you looking for? Recurrence at the anastomosis. Bingo. Local recurrence at the anastomosis. And also, you know, checking out the rest of the colon as well. But that's why you're really looking at it. That's why you're keying in on doing it one, three, and five years. Okay. I had a quick question. Uh, sure. I've seen a couple, we have a couple of new colorectal surgeons, and they have done a couple early Rick reversals. <laughs> Say it again. Early reversals of the ostomy. Yes. Is that, how new is that? And um, it, it's, it, it is it is pretty new. I, I I will, and it's very patient specific. By the book, it's usually six to eight weeks. Um, there are some patients that you have to do earlier, just because they're just not tolerating the ileostomy, whether because they're obese or they just keep coming into the hospital getting dehydrated and getting AKIs. Um, there, there's definitely a, a new push to get them done earlier in like, you know, three weeks, four weeks. Um, I just did, I did one like two months ago. That was like three and a half weeks. Cause the, the guy was very obese and just was having a horrible time, um, with the ostomy appliance. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it, it, it can be done. Um, I doubt they're going to ask you like, they're not, they're going to, they're going to give you a question. It's going to say a two weeks, B three weeks, C four weeks. Um, but if they give you a general broad range, I'd say six to eight weeks is still the safe answer. Thank you. But people, people are, are, are pushing it, especially the newer, more aggressive colorectal surgeons, um, like the one giving this talk. <laughs> um, usually, usually I, I wait four to five weeks, but I tell patients it could be as, as much as six to eight weeks. Cause you know, you got, it all depends on the patient. You know, if the patient is not doing well, they're malnourished. You know, you're not going to take them back. you got to wait for them to recover. All right. Um, genetics. Man, they love, love talking about genetics. So FAP, the most common one, right? You get asked about this so much, you think you're going to see it, see it every single week in your practice. You, you don't. You see it. I think, I, I think I've had like one patient who has it. Okay. So it's an autosomal dominant um, expression, the APC gene. Okay. Um, the way they ask these questions is they try to add, mess you up on the heritage of it. Not so much the details of it. The heredity of it is what they love to ask about. So FAP is autosomal dominant APC gene, meaning mom had the gene, dad had the gene, and you get both genes. Okay. Remember, FA, uh, FAP5 is the gene. I just remember it from chromosome 5. So I remember the FAB5. That's just the way I remember it. Okay. So the way it presents is polyps when you're when you're in puberty, okay? Polyps even younger. I, I the one patient that we had with uh, I, I I help out the pediatric surgeons over at the local children's hospital, and when it comes to this, uh, we had this one poor girl that has FAP started having polyps and bleeding at age seven, which is horrible. I felt so bad for her. Um, but essentially, you're gonna see. You guys have all seen the classic picture. It's a carpet of polyps, just hundreds and hundreds and thousands of polyps. Okay, the thing is all these polyps will turn into cancer, 100%. It's one of the very rare times in medicine, you can say 100%. So typically these patients need a proctocolectomy before the age of 20. Um, so a good question they like to ask, 
or you know, for your guys' knowledge, is why wait? Why wait till twenty? Why not do when they're when they're thirteen or fourteen? What do you guys think? So the main reason is you let you you try to let them grow. You're trying to let them grow the patients into full size, okay? Because as you stretch, as you get older, things like that, your body changes. So then the ostomy becomes mis displaced. So you want to try to let them um, reach at least after teenagers, 18, 19, 20 years old, before you proceed with a proctocolectomy, okay? So then when you talk to them, you talk to them about per, uh, pouching options like J pouches versus permanent ostomies, okay? Both are options and you gotta have a big conversation with not only the patient, but also the family as well. Because remember, this is not a 50, 60, 70 year old patient that you're talking to. You're This is a 20 young teenager patient. So the family is gonna be taking care of this. And if they come from a big line of FAP, the parents already know. So they can obviously have, have comments and have perspective um, to, the, to the patient. Um, actually, a, a good one I had was in the start of my uh, being an attending, I had a, a, a whole family that had FAP and the, um, the patient, he was 18 or 19, really wanted a J pouch. The mom had a J pouch and the mom actually had um, the J pouch taken down and ended up with a permanent ileostomy by the time she was like 35, 40 years old. And, you know, she told, she told her, her, um, her son, it's like, listen, it, it's not worth it. You know, the, I had a horrible time with the pouch. I had, you know, I, I couldn't travel. I couldn't do anything. You know, a, a five hour plane ride is going to the bathroom every two hours. Um, so, you know, it, it's nice to get the, um, the parents perspective to the kids. And it's always good to listen to that approach. Um, and it's good to invite them, in, especially if you have this strong family history. Okay. So a good one they love to ask is what causes death in these patients after the proctocolectomy? What, what is the thing that's going to cause these patients to die? What is, what is the tumor? Because it's not just colon cancer these guys are high risk of. What is, what is the other one? Duodenal. Duodenal ampullary masses. Very good. So along with screening colonoscopies every year, okay, um, the, uh, every year, they, they have to get an endoscopy every every two years. Okay? That's a good one to remember. All right? So let's go on to the – so another uh, – and, and there's also variants of FAP. There's one that increases intra-abdominal desmoids. Um, and osteomas, which is called Gardner's. There's another variant that's associated with brain tumors. It's called Turcotte's. The only way I've ever rem remembered Turcotte's is Turcotte's sounds like a very fancy, smart name. So I just remember it's associated with the brain. Um, that It's just my, my silly mnemonic or my way of remembering it. Um, in terms of desmoids, I doubt they're going to ask you much about desmoids other than they may show you a CT scan. Um, look, look online of what a desmoid tumor looks like on a CT scan, because that's something they may ask you to know, because the problem is with desmoid tumors, the treatment is changing. It used to be just surgery. Now we're talking about chemo, radiation, methyltrexate. There's a bunch of medications out there that are used to use, um, treat desmoids, but they don't have a lot of long-term data. So I, I don't, I doubt they're going to ask you about treatment of desmoids right off the bat for the app site, but in terms of maybe identifying it, I can easily see that as a, you know, patient has history of FAP, had a J pouch, all this stuff, and they show you a CT scan after some abdominal pain. Go into that and go on to um, Google or anything and look and see what a CT scan looks like for a desmoid. It's pretty classic. Actually showed up on my colorectal boards, actually. All right. Um, so Lynch, they love Lynch syndrome. Also autosomal dominant, about 5% of the population is considered to have Lynch, okay? I think it's kind of an overshoot, but that's what the book says. It's associated with DNA mismatch, MS1, MS2, and PMS2. Those are the ones they love to ask. It's very important to get a family history, not just about colon and rectal cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, bladder and stomach cancers are also other cancers in the family pool. So that's a very good thing. That's don't just focus on colon and rectal cancer. I always, I, I, so I never, every patient I interview, I never say, oh, do you have any family history of colon cancer? I ask, do you have any family history of cancer? And then you'd be surprised what patients will give you. Um, these patients, if you have a diagnosed Lynch, they start their colonoscopy surveillance at 20 to 25 years old, every two to five years, okay? I, my patients, I screen them every two years because I, I have seen some patients that have left off. I saw one guy in fellowship, I'll never forget, because of COVID, he didn't get scoped for four or five years, was always very good with his scopes. 
ended up with a right with a right colon cancer just for missing, you know, a scope for four years. Okay. Um, it's important and now it's more focused nowadays because you know back in the old days we didn't really know what Lynn syndrome was so when somebody came in with a sigmoid tumor at a relatively young age they just took out the sigmoid colon and that's it but now if you're suspicious of it you want to get this um, DNA testing first because can this change your can this change your 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 resection for, for surgery? Guys, what do you think? Can this change your surgical approach if you know this patient has Lynch syndrome? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it, it can. Because if they're positive for Lynch and they're young, let's say they're 30 or 40 years old, let's say they have a right colon cancer and you just do a right colectomy, their recurrence of another cancer as they get older goes up. So the first 10 years is like 15%. Then the next 20 years is as high as 40%. Again, every patient is a little different. If you're dealing with like a 70 year old with a right colon cancer and they're also positive for Lynch, then obviously you're not going to, you're likely not going to do a total colectomy if the rest of the colon is okay on a 70 year old, but on a 30 year old that, that plays. Okay. Um, look up Bethesda and Amsterdam criteria. It does have a section for Lynch syndrome, more common, obviously in your thyroid cancers, but look it up for, um, for Lynch syndrome as well. All right. Twisties. I love the twisties. I don't know why I'm like a magnet for these. I think I've had like six of them in the oh, last. Oh, go ahead. Uh, when do you start surveilling for FAP? FAP, you start surveil. You start surveilling usually once they hit 10 years old or on first diagnosis. But if let's say, for example, you have a family history of it, you have a known family history. They start getting scoped at eight to 10 years old every year. Technically, the book says every one to two years. I, I scope them every year. Thank you. But remember, you're going to scope them up until, you know, they get old enough to start getting uh, talk about surgery because you can't scope these patients forever because literally like it is a like just a row of polyps. You will never, never able to be able to resect all these polyps. You can't. Um, there are some variants of FAP that are rectal sparing. I doubt they're going to talk to you guys about those. That's more in the colorectal boards and colorectal fellowship. Um, type of question where you can perform a total colectomy and spare the rectum. You give them an ileorectal anastomosis with very, very close surveillance. But that that's more, I, I that, that's too that's too specific for the app side. I doubt they're going to get you into that. Um, and now in terms of the twisties, like every time I'm called, the PAs always laugh laugh at me because they, they know like one of these is going to come in. I don't know why. I've been a magnet for for volvuluses like the last, especially the last six months. So sigmoid volvulus, by far, by far the most common twist, okay? Typically, the app side is going to give you the very classic patient, debilitated, long-term psych patient, long history of constipation, takes laxatives, multiple laxatives every single day, okay? It is of concern because it, it causes a closed loop. It strangles the sigmoid colon, knocking out your IMA and the sigmoid arteries. So... If they come in and you see it, okay, and they're not peritonitic, your first answer is going to be decompressive colonoscopy because you can reduce this about 80% of the time. Now, is this a cure? Say, say it all with me. Is this a cure? Yes or no? No. There you go. No. I always get somebody that says yes. No. It will happen again. It's like when you guys, if you guys do any yard work, once you get a bad twist in a hose, is it, is it going to twist again? Yes. You know, that, you know, that el elasticity of the hose is too, is too haywire and it'll twist all over again. Okay. So that you, you guys answered, is that all you need to do? No, absolutely not. But the decompressive colonoscopy buys you time, right? It buys you time to properly medically clear the patient and also prep the patient. Because if you can get this patient stable, medically clear them and do a bowel prep in this patient, you can resect it and actually put them back together instead of giving them an ostomy, right? Because the problem is, guys, you know, with these patients, they're not the healthiest patients. If you give them a, a Hartman's, if you give them an end colostomy, what are really the chances they're going to be put back together? Right? Probably not very high, okay? So um, you do that, okay? Do not, now, if they give you a patient with a sigmoid virus and they're peritonitic, don't scope them, guys, because then you're going to, they're going to, you're going to perf them. So do not scope them. If they're peritonitic, 
They look terrible. They look sick. Got to take them to the OR. Resect. Bring up an ostomy. Okay. Very, very classic x-ray. Half the time the question is going to be, here's the x-ray. What does the patient have or what is the next step? Okay. So you see this big kidney bean, coffee bean look. Okay. It, this is the sigmoid box. The way you can tell is the bend. Okay. The bend of the tube is going towards the right upper quadrant. That's because the mesentery of the sigmoid pulls it that way because that's, that's how the mesentery is laid out. The same thing for cecovovulus. I'll show you the picture now. The reason why it goes up towards the left upper quadrant, the mesentery of the cecum gets pulled up towards the left upper quadrant. That's why the bends of, uh, of the uh, the shape is, is pointing in those directions. So for cecovovulus, please don't scope this patient if you have it, even if they feel fine. You're not, it's very, you have a very low chance of succeeding, okay? And it has a very high recurrence rate, okay? Um, usually it's younger patients, you know, 40s, 50 years old. Um, it can present it as, as a small bowel obstruction, obviously, because the illocecovov is usually involved with it, okay? You treat it with a right colectomy. There are some papers out there, and maybe some of you have seen that somebody has done a cecopexy where they anchor the cecum to the, to the abdominal wall. It's very, very, very debatable and not, not looked on upon well in the higher societies. Your answer is going to be right colectomy, okay? 100%. And they may even give you the option of a cecopexy, right colectomy, right colectomy. All right. Uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease. Man, they love it. Okay. You, you're, they, sometimes they can give you a lot of IBD. You feel like you're taking a GI test. Um, ulcerative colitis, bloody diarrhea, weight loss, abdominal pain. Those are, those are the big, big symptoms. Okay. For ulcerative colitis, it's mainly mucosa and submucosa involvement. That's a key feature to differentiate it between Crohn's. It's usually continuous and it's usually anus sparing. Okay. Not rectal sparing. It usually starts in the anus. It usually starts in the rectum but it's usually anal sparing, okay? You got to rule out infectious causes. Shigella, E. coli can all present with bloody diarrhea and things like that. So you got to rule out infectious causes, okay? Uh, your meds, okay? Steroids, uh, st uh, so I, I made a mistake there. So steroids used to be a maintenance therapy. They are not viewed as a maintenance therapy anymore. They're used to treat flares, okay? One of the indications to proceed with a proctocolectomy and possible pouch for UC is that you're forced to use steroids as a maintenance therapy because they just can't come off the steroids, okay? Um, other medications, mesalamine is used for maintenance. The big ones now is the biologics, okay? Your infleximab and TiVo, all those medications, they try to push towards that because they have had very good responses in putting these patients into remission and for maintenance, okay? So actually, it's not even for more advanced disease anymore. They really try to push to get these patients on biologics as quickly as possible, okay? Uh, toxic megacolon, they, this is a guaranteed question, okay? You're gonna have a UC patient come into the ED, tachycardic, elevated white count, abdominal pain, okay? If they're not peritonitic, you can treat them with NG tube, fluids, steroids, and antibiotics. 50% of them will recover, 50% of them will eventually need surgery. And if they need surgery, what is the surgery? Ahead, guys, guys. So total colectomy, they're going to get you on that because it's usually a subtotal colectomy because usually, usually you're taking to this, the, this taking, you're taking this patient to the OR pretty urgently Everything's a mess, okay? And the and the patient will even ask you. I had I had my last one that I did. I was like, Doc, you know, just take out my whole rectum while I'm down while you're there, because you know I'm gonna need my rectum out anyways. You can't do it. Everything is inflamed. Everything is nasty. Not the time to mess around with a proctectomy at this time, okay? You go down, go down to the rectal sigmoid junction or maybe the lower sigmoid, and take out the rest of the colon. Bring up an endoleostomy. That's your surgery of choice. Not time to do a complicated procedure. This patient is sick. Got to get in, got to get out. Okay. This is a classic CT scan. Okay. You'll see that the colon, especially the transverse colon is thickened a little bit. The key thing, a key marker they love to ask is if the transverse colon is, is uh, dilated more than six centimeters, that's a bad sign. Okay. So you got to watch these patients very, very closely. Okay. So. For IBD, okay, you do screen them for cancer and dysplasia, especially for ulcerative colitis, okay? 
these patients get a 1% increase in cancer every year after 10 years of, di of disease, which is why you screen them aggressively when they start eight to 10 years of their disease. Okay. All right. Uh, and remember that and when, if you go by the book, it's when they're diagnosed or when they first started having symptoms. So if you have a patient that you diagnose with ulcerative colitis, but they tell you, listen, I've had bloody diarrhea for five years. It's eight to 10 years from the five years, not the day they got diagnosed. Okay. They love to ask that question. Okay. So a big one is what if you find dysplasia? Okay. What, what's, what's the big deal with dysplasia? Okay, so dysplasia means high-grade dysplasia. That's what they're asking for is high-grade dysplasia. They're going to need, they're going to automatically need a proctocolectomy with a possible J pouch. Then that's for ulcerative colitis, okay? My big thing here for abscite, do not pouch Crohn's disease, okay? There are some institutes that do it, Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, okay? They, they will pouch some Crohn's patients, but it's very, very specific criteria for Crohn's, okay? They have a very strict guideline. So, but for the abscite and your guys' general knowledge, usually Crohn's disease do not get pouches. Remember, Crohn's disease is mouth to anus. So if you make a pouch out of the, out of the terminal ileum and it gets a flare, that's your pouch. So you have a whole host of complications from that. So typically Crohn's disease do not get pouches. I know some people have heard about it. You guys have, may have done it or I've heard of people do it. But for the abscite, generally the answer is we do not pouch Crohn's disease. Okay. So for ulcerative colitis, if you do have high grade dysplasia, what is the chance of having cancer in some part of the colon? Because that's why we do it. Okay. If we find high grade dysplasia in a random biopsy, uh, when we're doing these patients screening, we're worried that they have cancer somewhere in the colon. Okay. But what, what is the chance? It's been, it's been studied because for, for a while it was thought, man, are we really over-treating these patients just for one biopsy that says high-grade dysplasia? And actually, the research shows is 30 to 40% have, have some type of synchronous cancer in, the, in, the, in other parts of the colon. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, about low-grade dysplasia in this setting. Ah, low-grade dysplasia. I got they love that. Go, so, go for it. What's your question? Um, does that just shorten the time period between your scopes? Um, you don't actually resect with low grade dysplasia, correct? You have to wait for high grade dysplasia. You do, you do not. You do not uh, resect with low grade dysplasia. Um, however, if you have multiple sites of low grade dysplasia, then they technically would meet a criteria for that. Okay. Um, but with low grade dysplasia, if you notice active inflammation, you treat them first and usually rescope them within about six months or when the symptoms get better. All right, but that's a good question. I've never seen low grade dysplasia tested on the app site. High grade dysplasia all the time, all the time. Okay, um, very rare. They will give you. Someone's cleaning. <laughs> all right. So, uh, sorry. Um, they will some. I've never seen them ask about the old, the old uh, term, the dome the spot of high-grade dysplasia when you have actually a lesion that you find that shows high-grade dysplasia and only that part of the colon has it. I doubt they'll ask you about that because that is very controversial. Um, you know, there are some segments in the colorectal world that says you can, you, can, you can endoscopically resect that area and observe it and watch it. You tag it, you clip it, you tattoo it, um, and you can continue screening them appropriately. And there are some people that say, nope, it's high grade dysplasia, take out, take out the colon. So I, I doubt they're going to give you that question because that's still kind of up in the air. However, if you're doing random biopsies, high grade dysplasia, total proctocolectomy. Uh, question. Uh, sure. We start questions about chromoendoscopy. What is the rule of that? So chromoendoscopy, I've never seen even an abscite question about chromoendoscopy, but chromoendoscopy is a special type of endoscopy that we use with uh, with methylene blue, and it's a different um, view of the colonoscopy camera that essentially highlight, you're looking for lesions of that could contain dysplasia. It's usually done by our GI colleagues um, just because it's like an hour to two hour long colonoscopy um, that I just don't have the patience for. <laughs> and most colorectal surgeons probably don't. 
Um, but uh, but that it's mainly looking, it's, a, it's typically a better view to look for dysplasia versus your typical other um, biopsies and colonoscopies where you're doing a colonoscopy on regular scope and you're doing random biopsies, two, uh, two to four pieces every 10 to 15 centimeters of colon. It's on the FES now. Huh? It's on the FES now. Really? Wow. I hope they don't make me start doing them. Because <laughs> man, they're they're taught they're long scopes, they're long procedures. And, and and you can only bill bill it as a regular colonoscopy. Um, so they're very long procedures. Uh, and, and and you need you need training for it too. It's not just going in there and, and just doing a regular scope. You you gotta have some training with it. Um, and know what you're looking at. Um, so for IBD, they love asking about the extra colonic issues. Um, so essentially they'll ask you is after resection for ulcerative colitis, which is going to get better. So it's the ocular, the arthritis and anemia. I remember eyes, bones, and blood, they get better. What doesn't get better is the primary sclerosing cholangitis and the alkalosing, uh, the alkalosing spondylitis. Um, pyridoma gangrenosum, 50, 50. Okay. They will ask about HLA B27. You have to remember that it's associated with sarcoiliitis, echolosing spondylitis, and ulcerative colitis. They, they, it's just a, ra a random question they love to ask. That's an easy point. But they will ask, and they love to ask about after resection for UC, which gets better, which does not get better, and which is kind of 50-50, or, or continuing symptoms. They, that's what they call it. Okay. Uh, this is a nice little diagram. I pulled this right out of Absite Killer. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. If you remember this, you're guaranteed you're guaranteed to get a question or two right. Uh, carcinoid. So the random tumors in the colon and the rectum. They love this. Okay, um, two out of three already have local or systemic spread when you find them. Um, low rectal carcinoids over two centimeters need an APR. Less than two centimeters, you can do a, a wide local excision with negative margins. That's probably as as aggressive they will get with uh, with rectal carcinoids. There are other Things you can do with carcinoids that are a little bit uh, more 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 advanced that I that they're not going to ask you because it's it's still controversial. Um, so for colon and high rectal, you can do up to one centimeter polypectomy. Over one centimeter, you're going to need a formal resection. Um, in the in uh, when it's in the colon, for squamous cell cancer in the anus, the treatment is nigro protocol. I have seen them ask, what is the Nigro protocol? It's radiation and chemotherapy. Here the chemo is 5-FU and mitomycin. Now, in terms of how much radiation and the regimen of chemo, I've never seen them ask that, but I have seen them ask, what is the chemotherapy? So it's typically 5-FU and mitomycin. It cures about 80% of the time. Um, surgery is usually an APR um, for failure or recurrent disease. Um, they will love to ask you that the patient is actively getting Nigro protocol and the lesion that you're worried about or that is the squamous cell cancer continues to look ulcerated, looks inflamed, is maybe a little bit bleeding, and they're really like one or two months out of treatment. You wait. You want to give them at least six months after treatment. Some books even say up to a year because the radiation will make it will make the lesion swell up and inflame and then it comes back down. So you got to let the radiation work the entire time. Um, I have seen this once in a while, melanoma of the anus. I've never seen it as, um, uh, I, I actually, I saw one, I saw one actually a couple months ago. It was the only one I've ever seen. It was a melanoma. It was actually a rectal tumor, like in the middle of the rectum that was positive for melanoma. Um, it's the, actually the third most common site of melanoma after the skin and the eyes. It's very rare. It's usually systemic when found. Um, only one third of the lesions are actually pigmented. A lot of these sometimes get mistaken for external thrombos hemorrhoids. So in my practice, always send your hemorrhoids out for pathology. Always. Just send them. Okay. Um, typically, it is an APR. If, it, if it's locally, it's right there on the sphincters. These patients have a very poor prognosis. However, there is some new research going into immunotherapy to try to treat these patients and so far have pretty good effects. There is a couple of areas where you can do a wide local resection of melanoma, especially if it's a, if it's in the perianal area, it's a two centimeter margin that is not involving the sphincters. Okay. I've never seen them ask that. Usually I've seen them ask that you get a melanoma right on the sphincters. What is the treatment? APR. 
because the wide local um, uh, resection is still a little debated. Um, I doubt they'll give you that. All right, painful consults. They're painful consults and they're painful outside questions. But if you if you know it, you'll get it. Okay. I'm sorry yes. to um, interrupt you, but we are a little bit running short of, on time. Oh, we are. I'm sorry. Yes. All right, I'll run through. I, I think I'm I'm pretty much done here. Um, so uh, painful consults. We all get them. Five o'clock in the morning. Hey, abdominal distension, no signs of obstruction, colon dilatation on imaging. What is it? Ogilvy. Ogilvy's. Ogilvy's. It always shows up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why they call. So pseudo obstruction of the colon. Okay. It can perforate. Be careful when the colon, especially the cecum, goes over 10 centimeters. That's your magic key point. Okay. I like to know over nine just because I, I, I know what to expect. Um, you know, you so for Ogilvy's, you follow... The path you follow the regimen okay iv fluids fix the electrolytes especially potassium and magnesium check all the drugs that they're on are there any are they on chronic uh, opioids get an ng tube you can decompress them with a scope okay and ideally you got to do something to evaluate the colon whether it be a scope or gastrogaffin enema before you start talking about neostigmine okay um because remember neostigmine essentially is going to make the colon empty and if you have an obstruction you can perforate them, okay? The danger of neostigmine, you guys know what neostigmine is? It can cause severe bradycardia. So typically when neostigmine is gonna be given, the patient is transferred to step down or the ICU to cut for cardiac monitoring, okay? GI bleeding, super common. Start with the basics, resuscitate and stabilize. Quickly rule out an upper GI with an NG tube, gastric lavage. Very important, they love to ask that, okay? Find the bleed. You can find it with a CTA. You can find it with a bleeding scan or you can find it with a colonoscopy, okay? If they're not responding, obviously, to the transfusions, they keep bleeding, you, uh, you, you, know, you try to locate where the bleeding is and you resect that area. If you can't locate the bleed and it's somewhere, you think it's somewhere in the colon, then unfortunately, you got to do a total colectomy. And it's not fun. I've done like four or five in my career. None of them do well. It is not a fun case. Um, diverticular is way more the most, the way the most common, uh, of, uh, of GI bleeds, especially in the colon. It is usually pain is bleeding. It's usually arterial. The good thing is about 75% of them stop. 80% of the diverticuli are found in the left colon, but you can have right sigmoid ticks and they tend to bleed more. Okay. The reason being is the colon is thinner. So the blood vessels are more prominent on the right side. So they, they tend to bleed a good bit. They, they can bleed a lot. Um, up to 25% of these bleeds can recur. And if it's a very common recurrence and it's the same spot, you're going to need a resection. Uh, they love talking about angio dysplasia. I think I've seen angio dysplasia once in my entire life, but they love asking it on the app site. It's less severe, but it recurs a lot, almost 80% of the time. It's usually a very slow venous bleed. They have an association with aortic stenosis. Okay. They love to ask that. By far, the most common abscite question you guys will get is it's in the ascending colon. Uh, ischemic colitis, you guys know you guys know about this. They love asking ischemic colitis after a AAA repair because they knocked out the IMA. Okay, and you'll typically present with bloody bowel movements after surgery. Patient is not doing well, has new onset abdominal pain. You can image them with a CTA or a CT, but honestly, a flex sig is the best way to diagnose it. Because if you look at the mucosa and it is black or uh, ischemic, you're going to surgery. You're going to give them a Hartman's and an ostomy. Uh, diverticulitis, pretty common. You guys know it's an inflammation of the diverticuli. Uh, starts with pain, possible fever, can usually treat with antibiotics and bowel rest. They love talking about complicated versus uncomplicated. The uncomplicated being perforations, abscesses, and fistulas. Colovaginal in women is the most common. Whole vesicle in men is most common. However, after a woman gets a hysterectomy, it's the same. All right. And then I do have a little bit about hemorrhoids and rectal prolapse. And then after that, it's questions. So I know you guys are running a little on time. You got to go to your next um, uh, topic. I'll send you guys this, the, the PowerPoint because I do have like 15 questions that are actually very good questions and um, will be a nice review for you guys. Gotcha. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Calabell. I hope you enjoy your game. Later. Yes, thank let's go so Dolphins. Much. No problem, guys, okay? I'll send you out the uh, the PowerPoint because there is a couple things about the, you know, uh, anal rectal anatomy, abscesses, fissures that they do like to test. 
if you read through my slides, you'll get you'll get a big chunk of it. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thanks so much. All right. No problem, guys. Thank okay. Good, good luck on good luck on the upside and good luck studying, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. We're running a little.